I guess the game that I played after that was Cuphead. Yeah, I sort of jumped on the bandwagon with this one, but when I heard that an indie game was getting this much praise, I had to try it out. I'd also heard that it was an insanely hard game, so I knew what I was getting into, and I have played very difficult platformers before. I've beaten Henry Hatsworth in the Puzzling Adventure, for example, which I might even do on this channel at some point. Basically, I knew what I was getting into. And this game, well... Yeah, let me just say that I haven't beaten this game yet, and it has been a while since I bought it, but the reason why is, well, I've been roadblocked by something beginning with Dr. Carl and ending with Zrobot, but also because this is a game that I need to take long breaks from between play sessions. My adrenaline kind of goes into overdrive during these boss fights, and they often result in a lot of screaming rage. So after playing for a while, I kinda need to stop for health reasons. So this is a very, very difficult game. Especially for someone like me who, while I do play platformers a lot, as much as my content on this channel would say otherwise, I've never really played much in the way of the run and gun style. I've only played one Mega Man game, and that was one of the easier ones, Mega Man 6. I knew what to expect, but one thing that I wasn't quite prepared for is how drastic the difficulty spike is between each island. The general theme would be that I'd go through one island, have a huge amount of trouble with most of the bosses, but then get to the next island, and upon doing my first boss there, instantly get hit with the feeling, ha, huh, suddenly all those bosses from before don't seem so bad, in fact, they all seem easy in comparison. Island 1 is already fairly tough by normal standards, apart from the first boss, but it looks like a complete joke compared to Island 2, which in turn looks like a complete joke compared to Island 3, and that's really saying something given that Island 2 contains Grim Matchstick. In particular, Island 3 ratchets the difficulty up from extremely hard, but pretty much what I expected, to oh god, are you kidding me? But the fact that this game is hard does not by any means make it a bad game. Nearly all the difficulty feels legitimate to me, and never cheap. These fights were usually learnable with practice, and I often would find that the longer I spent on a fight or platforming level, the further I would get with each attempt. And that, to me, is the mark of good, learnable difficulty. There is one exception I have to this, though. Rumor Honeybottoms. I feel that's the one fight that I would consider legitimately unfair, for one very specific reason. You're battling on a constantly falling set of platforms. New platforms keep scrolling in from the top of the screen, but they are randomly positioned and you won't know where they are until they actually come on screen. But, they still exist while they're off screen. Where am I going with this? Well, if you're at the very top of the screen, and you often need to be to dodge some of the attacks, it's very possible, and in fact quite likely, to jump and then get caught on an off-screen platform that you couldn't have possibly known where it was, resulting in you completely losing track of where Cuphead is and getting hit. This happened to me an absolute ton. And whenever I got hit this way, it was one of the few times in the game I could legitimately say that wasn't my fault. What makes this so glaring is this is the first boss fight accessible to you on Island 3. So getting stuck here does wall the player out of a lot of progress, and it can be very frustrating. So that's the only fight that I consider to be outright cheap. One interesting thing that I do find about looking into this game is just how subjective the difficulty of various bosses tends to be. There are a couple of bosses that are usually agreed on, but as for the others, different players tend to have trouble with different bosses. For example, I'd heard very bad things about Calamaria, but I beat her in less than 10 attempts, and the time where I succeeded, I didn't even take any damage. Meanwhile, I was stuck on Hildeberg, the first plane boss, for about two days. I'd also heard a lot of people had trouble with Baroness Von Bonbon's Jawbreaker Pac-Man minion, but to me that was the easiest of her minions by far. I was actually relieved when she used that attack. 
Jimmy the Great's cat attack that he can open the fight with. A lot of people think that's a nightmare. I actually wanted him to do that. I found it not that hard to dodge. By contrast, I was stuck on Beppy the Clown for a really long time. Of course, there were some bosses that are generally agreed on to be difficult that I found difficult as well. Grim Matchstick definitely, and especially Dr. Carl's Robots. That thing is the sole reason I haven't beaten this game yet. Apparently it's so bad that Dr. Carl and his robot don't even get very much fan art within the community. Because it seems to be one of the few fights that inspires genuine hatred rather than almost respect for its difficulty. To give you an idea, it took me many, many attempts to learn how to survive the first five seconds of that fight. And things only get worse from there. The fight is basically Engine from Crash Bandicoot, but instead of destroying his mech's parts, getting rid of attacks, it instead replaces those attacks with even worse attacks. And you know what? I haven't even got to his Dr. Wily capsule phase, and I hear that's the worst part. In fact, it's so bad that apparently a patch nerfed that phase of the fight. That leads me into one aspect of this game's difficulty that I don't see that often in action games. This game is not only physically taxing in terms of dodging attacks, it's also mentally taxing. There's often so much you have to keep track of on screen at once. Let's use Captain Brinybeard as an example. All through the entire fight, there is a barrel that is moving around the top of the screen that will fall on you, and when it's ready to fall is based on its expression. The captain himself can pull out his octopus gun and shoot a bunch of pellets at you. Some of those pellets are pink and can be parried, some of them are yellow and cannot be parried. After you damage him slightly, he'll then start whistling to summon sea creatures. There are three different variants of this attack, and all of them have slightly different audio cues before the attack begins, and you need to know which cue is which. Then, when you damage him further, in addition to all of this, his ship starts spitting out cannonballs periodically that you need to jump over. You also have to keep track of your positioning, which shot type you're using, if you're using charge shots, how far charged you are, and your special meter. And you know what the best part of all this is? Captain Brinybeard is one of the easiest bosses on Isle 3. So yeah, mentally exhausting as well as physically exhausting. That's a good way to describe these fights, and why I had to take a long break after every major victory. So, gameplay-wise, I do think this is an amazing game. I'm just not really all that skilled at this kind of thing. It's the kind of game that I would probably more enjoy watching other people play than actually playing myself. It hurts to admit this as an obsessive completionist, especially as far as achievements are concerned, but I'm probably not going to 100% achievement this game. Mainly because getting the higher ranks requires you to no damage all of these fights, and I really don't think that's happening anytime soon. And if it was, it would just cause me so much frustration. I'll probably leave it to watching s rank fights on YouTube. But while I may not personally be all that skilled at this game, I am so glad that I paid money for it. So much effort went into this game, and the art style in particular is absolutely amazing. They replicated the style of 1930s animation so well, even down to the visual effects like the grainy screen. It reminds me a lot of another game I played this year, Persona 5, in that every element of the game's design and interface just fits with the core aesthetic they were going with so well. The jazz soundtrack, the title cards before the bosses... It's all amazing. And even the core concept of the game, I love the idea of bosses that weaponize wacky cartoon physics. These people deserve money for all their hard work, and I'm so glad that I gave it to them. So to overall rate this game as much as how I enjoyed it, it's kind of hard for me. This game completely destroyed me and made me very angry and frustrated most of the time, but not really in a bad way. I can't ever say that I had a bad time with this game. I actually quite enjoyed it. So I guess I'll say in terms of personal enjoyment of 4 out of 5, deducting one point because I kind of suck at the game. But I still think this is a really, really amazing and unique game, and definitely deserves attention. The next game I played in 2017... 
Actually, this one's a little hard to describe. So, I got a Nintendo Switch on my birthday, and I got a certain game with it. However, I didn't end up playing very far into this game before I quit for various reasons. So, I'm going to talk about that one later, and instead focus on the next major game I played, which is the one that was really the first time I genuinely used the Switch. And that is Super Mario Odyssey. I could very easily make an entire thoughts video on this game alone. If people want to hear that, I'd be interested to do it. But here are my thoughts for now. So you may be wondering why I thought of this game. Because, well, Breath of the Wild took its series in a very, very open world direction and I hated it. So evidently, I'd probably hate Odyssey too, right? Actually, no. Not only did I really, really love Odyssey, it's probably my new favourite Mario game, and it, along with Persona 5, is one of the games that gave me the most joy of any game I played this year. It's kind of weird to describe why. But here's how I can best put it. Breath of the Wild completely demolished every previous convention about the series, except maybe the first game's open world, and rebuilt the entire franchise anew from scratch. Odyssey, on the other hand, feels very, very innovative and new, but at the same time also feels like a natural evolution on the 3D Mario formula. I really admire how much this game was able to innovate on the formula, while at the same time, it didn't feel like it had totally abandoned its roots. I describe Super Mario Odyssey as taking the best elements from 64, Sunshine, and Galaxy. 64's diverse array of movement options and the core concept itself, Sunshine's bigger explorable worlds, and in some way they added in the blue coins mechanic but made it marginally less annoying, and Galaxy's tighter platforming design. Before I gush about this game though, I want to get a few negatives out of the way. There are really two main flaws that I have with this one. The first is the controls. The controls actually take a little getting used to, and some of them can be a bit awkward to get working consistently. Most of these are moves that require a press of ZL and the jump button. Things like the cap dive, faster swimming underwater, and to some extent the long jump. When I first started this game, I actually had trouble getting the long jump to work consistently. It turns out that instead of pressing crouch and jump at the same time, which I think was how it worked in the earlier 3D Marios, you have to press crouch slightly before jump. Once I learned that, I was able to get the long jump consistent, but it took a while and a surprising amount of frustration before that clicked. The cap dive, though, that took me a lot longer to get working. In fact, I didn't fully realise how to do it until very late into the post-game, when I'd already almost 100%ed the entire game. Turns out that it's less about pressing crouch and Y at the same time, and more about cancelling out of a ground pound with a dive. I found that you actually have quite a lenient amount of time after Mario flips over in the air and does the butt stomp animation to dive cancel out of it. And it's the same for the fast swimming move. Even then, the fact that you have to do a cap throw and hold Y, then jump, then do that, makes it a little annoying to pull off and I still can't get it entirely consistent. Normally though, this is only a minor flaw, because the cap dive and fast swimming are never truly required to get anything for the vast majority of the game. They're all just optional movement techniques to make getting around a bit easier. That is until some of the post-game races outright require cap dive jumps. Cap dive jumps over bottomless pits at that. This gets a little frustrating when you're suddenly expected to have mastered a move that is never required during the main game. I've also heard that this tends to trip up speedrunners in particular. Obviously, they need to get movement techniques working 100% consistently. So that's one slight flaw that I have with the game. The other is the way that some of the post-game moons are handled. None of the moons that I got during the main game really felt like padding. It felt like there was just the right number per world, and most of them were pretty satisfying to collect. In the post-game though, around 20 or so more moons open up in every kingdom you've previously visited. And while some of these are hidden in new mini-levels, which I really liked, 
There are some that just left me thinking, why? Sometimes a post-game moon would just be lying around in the open, in a location that you've already been through tons of times exploring the level normally. So, it really didn't feel like the location of this moon added anything new. And that, to me, did feel like padding. And there are hundreds of moons like this if you take all the worlds into account, and that was admittedly feeling like the game was overstaying its welcome just a tiny bit. Other than that, my only downsides with the game are a couple of very minor nitpicks that don't affect the gameplay at all. Firstly, WHERE'S LUIGI?! Look, I know Luigi was not in 64 or Sunshine, but seriously, such a big major Mario release and Luigi doesn't even make a physical appearance? And no, unlocking his outfit in the postgame does not count. Secondly, I can't be the only one who is a little disappointed by the ending. Without spoiling anything, let's just say there was something I felt they were leading up towards that they kind of did a 180 on and decided to play it safe. And to me, this game already being a big step forward for the series, it felt like the perfect time to do something like that and shake up the status quo. Oh, and while we're on the subject of minor nitpicks, screw beach volleyball. I really don't know why the heck they thought it was a good idea to make the requirement for the first moon, 15, and the requirement for the second, 100. Made worse by the fact that the volleyball takes so long to actually speed up to the point where you go through volleys quickly. So every time you fail, you're stuck going through the same painful 30 slow bounces. Anyway though, I think it's pretty safe to say that everything else I loved about this game. The worlds are great, what I loved is the settings are quite unique for a Mario game. After so many games of just the desert world, the ice world, the jungle world, I mean this game kinda had worlds like that, but even when they did use common themes, they twisted them in some way. Like the desert world having a Mexican Day of the Dead theme for example. Or the snow world having those, and I feel like this is the absolute best description I've ever heard for them, Sphiel Goron hybrids. But we also had some settings that were totally new that we had never seen in a Mario game before. In particular, what they did with a certain classic late game Mario world. The worlds felt decently large and fun to explore, but none of them were so big as to feel confusing. And unlike Breath of the Wild, there weren't any parts of these worlds that felt pointless to me. The stretches of desert and the Sand Kingdom are really the only exception, but other than that, I felt like every part of each world had a reason to be there. Heck, even very out of the way ledges that you can't access without insane speedrunner movement tech often have a pile of coins hidden on them. I was conflicted about the way they handled power moons at first. I was worried it would be like the shrines in Breath of the Wild, where I didn't really enjoy 120 mini dungeons as much as, let's say, Twilight Princess's 10 big dungeons. Here, I didn't really mind the fact that some moons were just sitting out in the open for you to grab. In some ways, it felt like a lot of classic collectathon platformers. These moons weren't so much full missions like Sunshine 64 or Galaxy and more like those little collectibles you find hidden out of the way. It feels weird to be comparing this to, at the time, one of Nintendo's biggest rivals, but I almost got a Spyro the Dragon sense out of some of the exploration. You're going around a level and, hey, there's a crystallized dragon here, or hey, there's a dragon egg here. There are also the regional currency or purple coins. I'm a little divided on this. I do think it's a lot better than how Super Mario Sunshine handled blue coins. A lot better. But I really didn't like the fact that the only way to mark them on your map was locked behind an amiibo. Like, the Mario and Peach amiibo bonuses were more just things you could use to make the game easier if you wanted to, but this, like, finding the last couple of coins you were missing is very, very annoying without either looking up on the internet or buying a Bowser amiibo, so that I wasn't really a fan of. But other than that, I did like collecting the local currency. I also liked there were still a few traditional missions per world, though some worlds barely had any. And another thing that I'm not such a big fan of, the fact that you can't repeat those missions. I guess the outfits, I wasn't really that big of a fan of. For me, Mario just feels weird wearing any clothes other than his iconic ones. 
But the real kicker for me was that, aside from the fact that some of them let you open up more moons, there was no gameplay benefit to any of these outfits. This is just an entirely personal thing, but I will never play dress up with characters just for the sake of playing dress up. To me, there needs to be some kind of concrete gameplay benefit in order for me to actually use alternate outfits. Like the ones in Breath of the Wild, for example. I understand that giving each outfit its own gameplay effect would probably be very hard to implement given how many of them there are, and there was always the risk that some of them could totally break the game, but still, I'm never really a fan of dress up just for the sake of dress up. Also, the capture system is great, there's really not much I can say about it, but a lot of the forms you go into all have some really cool abilities, some of which have never really been done in a Mario game before. I particularly like Uproot and Gushurn. As well as a creature from a spoiler world that I personally refer to as the Pecky Pointy Bird. All of these forms also have really great platforming challenges designed around them, so they're all really fun to do. I admit that a couple of them can feel a little awkward. I personally wasn't that big of a fan of the Hammer Bros being constantly hopping. That could be a little hard to control sometimes. But for the most part, the captures play very well. I really loved all the different worlds, all the collectibles, this was just a really great game to me. This is also one of the first games in a while that I decided to go into mostly unspoiled, and as a result some of the later worlds really surprised me. Though one of them in particular felt like not nearly enough was done with it. You probably know the world that I'm talking about, but to me it kinda came out of nowhere and was never even mentioned again afterwards, on top of being really short. So overall, well it should tell you something, that I completely 100% of this game, apart from buying some of the more expensive outfits, so yes, that is all 999 moons, all regional currency, all souvenirs, all of the music, and all of the captures. And with a few exceptions, I loved every single moment of it. This was one of the games, along with Persona 5, that gave me the most joy of any game I played this year. So, definitely a 5 out of 5 in terms of my personal enjoyment here. So, after Odyssey, well, the next game was Xenoblade Chronicles 2, and, well, I've only just started that one, so I can't really say much about it yet. It's probably shaping up to be another 5 out of 5, though. So, that ends the games I played in 2017 that I want to talk about, but first I want to discuss one game that I almost played in 2017. The reason why I didn't want to talk about this before? This was actually planned as a blind run. In fact, I recorded quite a bit of the start of the game. I didn't want to reveal which game it was because I didn't want people spoiling anything of it for me. I'm still mostly unspoiled on the game itself in case I do plan on doing it. But I just wasn't really feeling it when I recorded the start. I won't go into too much detail about this, but I was a little bit depressed in real life at the time. And that made it hard for me to be enthusiastic about recording. But what made it worse was that this game's overall tone and sense of humour really wasn't my kind of thing. And as a result, I was left in awkward silence through a lot of cutscenes. While the actual gameplay of it I did enjoy, I started to feel like this wasn't the kind of game that I would want to blind run because I personally felt I just couldn't really be entertaining with my commentary, because my personal commentary style doesn't really gel with the game's tone. And I feel like, especially with a blind run, if you're not having fun, you should really just stop. Because making it a blind run, I had the pressure of, okay, I cannot play this game unless I am feeling up to recording it. And that hanging over my head made it even harder to want to enjoy the game and go back to it. So, now I can reveal what game that was. It was Mario and Rabbids Kingdom Battle. I'd heard very, very good things about this game. Many people said the game was better than it had any right to be. And hearing that it was a turn-based strategy game of all things really piqued my interest. Because of that, I thought it would make for good blind run potential. So I booted it up, started recording, and... yeah. Like I said, I did really enjoy the strategy gameplay, but I just couldn't get over the game's overall sense of humour and tone not meshing with my personality at all. It just felt a little too juvenile for my liking, a lot of puns and toilet humour. 
Which are both my least favourite forms of humour entirely. And even their few attempts at quote-unquote clever lines just came across as awkward and forced to me. I recorded, I'd say probably most of World 1, and I still do have the footage, but I still don't really feel like I want to continue this as a blind playthrough. It may be the kind of game that I can enjoy on my own time, but in doing a blind run of it, the dissonance with the sense of humour just is a bit too much, and it really doesn't make for good commentary with me. I mean, if I'm not finding the game entertaining, I know that you're not going to find me talking about the game entertaining. And I'm also not one to be negative, so I really don't want to do a blind playthrough of a game where I'm constantly going around saying, I don't find this funny. Playing this game on my own time though, I'd be able to appreciate the gameplay without having to worry about keeping up entertaining commentary through cutscenes that I'd rather ignore. So, while there is a slight chance I may decide to resume this someday, I'm still not really sure. I might go looking for a different game to do a blind run of. So those are all the games I played in 2017 that I wanted to talk about, but I also wanted to talk about a couple of games that I would have played in 2017, but didn't get a chance to due to lacking the time, money, or other things. The first of these is Nier Automata, and the only reason I didn't play this game is that I didn't own a PlayStation 4 at the start of the year. I feel like this really is the kind of game that I would probably be interested in. In fact, the only reason I didn't play the original Nair was because it was Xbox 360 exclusive in the West. Also, as an older brother myself, I feel a little bit offended that they didn't think the West would accept the game unless the protagonist was a big hulking man father. But that's another issue entirely. Though I should quickly get out of the way, please don't ask me to play Drakengard. I know that is the series that leads into Nair, but from what I know about Drakengard, it sounds way too dark and bleak for my liking. But from what I've heard of Nair Automata, it really does sound like the kind of game that I'd like. An action RPG with good characters and a thought-provoking story. Admittedly, I have been spoiled on quite a few story details in researching the game but it still sounds like a game that I would like to play someday. Next on my list of games I wish I played, Metroid Samus Returns. The main reason I didn't play this one was because I didn't have the time around the game's release date, and at the time that I, well, did have enough free time, the game was completely sold out everywhere across Australia. I am not kidding, I didn't see a single copy of this game on store shelves after the first week of its release. Either the game was just that good, or they had no confidence that people would buy this game after Other M, and so they shipped Australia a pathetically tiny number of copies. Either way, it was annoying. I was then tossing up whether I should get the game as a digital copy on my American 3DS, which is the one with the capture card, so that one day I might be able to record a minimalist run of it. I'm still kind of deciding whether or not to do that, so for the time being I haven't got this game, but I probably will play it someday. The other game I wish I played? A Hat in Time. The only reason I didn't get A Hat in Time was that by the time that I was considering getting it, Super Mario Odyssey was just around the corner, and I didn't really feel like having two collectathon platformers going at once. I've also watched a lot of a Let's Play of A Hat in Time, so there'd be less new for me to discover there, but from what I've seen, it definitely seems like a very good game. Admittedly, it does dip quite heavily into Henry-style humour sometimes, but that's not enough to put me off from the gameplay. So again, that's a game that I might consider getting in the future. I guess you guys are probably wondering about two games here and why they are on this list, Fire Emblem Warriors and Pokemon Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon. In my thoughts on Heroes, I already explained why I don't intend on buying Warriors anytime soon. As for Pokemon, I want to watch a little more of Maryland's walkthrough and get an idea of just how different the game is and whether that really justifies buying it at the moment. It's only been a year since the original Sun and Moon, and from what I hear, these games aren't that much different. Really, the only reason I'd consider buying these games is if I wanted to train up a Naganadal or Blacephalon. And that's buying a whole game just for two Pokemon. So for now, I'm saving my money for other releases. 
I should mention, though, that I didn't play Black 2 until maybe two years after it came out. And at the time that I did, I ended up really loving it. So that may end up being the case for these games. For now, XD and the original Sun and Moon are enough to give me my Pokemon fix. Perhaps even more annoyingly, there was a game this year that I actually bought and yet was unable to play. That game was Total War Warhammer. I got this on Steam around the same time I got the Trails in the Sky games because there was a huge Steam sale. And, well, the menus were perfectly fine, the cutscenes were perfectly fine, but any time the game went into an actual battle, all of the graphics just came out entirely black. So, pretty much unplayable. I tried to look up advice on this online, and the best I could get was people telling me to get a better graphics card. So, yeah, that's a shame. Seems like my computer just can't handle this game. Again, a real shame since I would have loved to have played this one. I heard very good things about it, and it sounds like the kind of strategy gameplay I'd enjoy. But, uh, yeah, wasn't able to. I guess that'll be when I get a better computer. So, that's my thoughts on the games I played of the year that was. All in all, I think it was a very, very good year for games. My personal game of the year, and again, this is just my personal opinion in terms of how much I enjoyed the games, but it would probably be a very, very hard decision between Persona 5 or Super Mario Odyssey. Persona 5 might edge slightly above, but only very, very, very slightly. Both games were amazing, and definitely were the two games that gave me the most joy this year. However, like I said, it's definitely possible that Xenoblade Chronicles 2 will be a contender for that spot. And, also, having started Final Fantasy XV recently, I've been very pleasantly surprised. The game is not at all what I expected, and I'm actually really liking it. But that should about do it for this video series, so I hope you've enjoyed listening to me ramble on about the games I played this year, and here's hoping 2018 will be another great year for games.